All right, as we've said, it's good to see you tonight. Appreciate you being in the house of God. Be much in prayer for all the classes downstairs. Uh, Awanas, and we can move that one away now. Uh, Awanas and uh, the youth over in the other building, just pray that God would just have his way uh, in the classes and the things that that are being taught over there. Uh, If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Daniel. And uh, we're going to, actually, this is probably, the fu- this message and next time will be the last two messages in our series on uh, believing in Babylon, a godly witness in a hostile culture. Uh, we're going to be looking at chapter 6 in both of these uh, messages uh, and looking at the importance of, go- of courage and a godly witness. Uh, Daniel 6 is another one of those uh, passages of Scripture that if you've been in church any length of time at all, uh, you know uh, the story that's here. You know the account. But uh, hopefully tonight, as we look at this chapter, uh, we'll see some things, I pray, that will help us uh, in the day in which we live. Uh, So let's begin reading Daniel chapter number 6, verse number 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three, oh, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Now that word damage there just basically means that there wouldn't be any loss. In other words, what Darius was concerned about was because of the structure that he had inherited from the Babylonian Empire and the, and the fall of Belshazzar and all the stuff there, there was plenty of opportunity in, uh, for, um, uh, let's just say, uh, graft uh, to occur among the leaders. And so his concern uh, was to make sure that he covered that, and that word damage just means that he would not suffer loss. In other words, uh, they wouldn't be robbing him blind, okay? So then in verse number 3, Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to sit him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governor and the princes, the counselors, the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself. Notice that. He was sore displeased with himself. And set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed. Let's pray. Father, I ask now that you just hide me behind Calvary as we try to uh, share from this passage tonight and the next service the things that you've burdened my heart with as we look at this idea or this theme of how important it is to have courage in a hostile culture. 
Father, I pray that you just use me to share the truths that you've burdened my heart with, and we'll give you the praise and the glory for all that you do as a result. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, in chapter 5 last time, we saw the fall of the Babylonian Empire, that head of gold that Nebuchadnezzar saw in that dream all the way back in chapter number 2. Now, now we move on to the time that's represented by the silver chest and torso. We've moved into the realm of the Medo-Persian Empire. And Darius, what we have to understand here is that Darius was not the king of the entire Medo-Persian Empire. As a matter of fact, what he really was in the structure of the Medes and the Persians, what he was was the governor of Babylon. And he was commissioned by the true king, King Cyrus, to rule the district of Babylon in another region past uh, the Euphrates River known as the district beyond the river. His name in Hebrew, we see it here, is Darius. But in the Medo-Persian uh, empire, in the Medo-Persian language, his name was Gabaru or Gabrius. And, and, and he was the son, actually, of Ahasuerus. Now, Ahasuerus, if, you, if that name sounds familiar, go to the book of Esther, and you'll see the king there, as Ahasuerus, and that's the father here of uh, Gabrius, or as we see it here in Daniel, uh, uh, Darius. Now, Darius quickly took charge. We know that Darius was responsible. If you go back to chapter number 5, you know that Darius was responsible for the siege of the city. We know it was Darius who led the, uh, the troops in, took the city because of uh, a bribe that they offered somebody who was watching one of the gates along the river. And they came into the city through those gates, and they came up into the middle of the city, and that's how everything happened as far as being able to um, actually take the city. And so Darius was given charge of that district, and very quickly he began to try to set things up uh, in an efficient way so that he could govern uh, the kingdom. Uh, according to Warren Wiersbe, I'm going to read you something here a little bit at length here. It says, Darius must have suspected that the officers he had inherited were not doing their work faithfully, but were robbing him of wealth, and his suspicions were correct. It was impossible for Darius to keep his hands on everything in the empire because that would have involved supervising every worker, auditing every account, and checking on every assignment. The king had to depend on his officers to see that the work was done well, and this meant that he had to appoint officers he could trust. Darius was a man experienced in the ways of the world, and he knew that there was plenty of opportunity for graft in the Babylonian empire. A wise leader first gathers information, and Darius soon learned about Daniel and the reputation he had for honesty and wisdom, or what the KJV calls an excellent spirit. It's likely that Daniel was in semi-retirement at this time, but the king appointed him to be one of three key administrators over the kingdom. These three men were to manage the affairs of the 120 leaders who ruled over the provinces and to report directly to the king. Daniel proved to be such a superior worker that Darius planned to make him his number one administrator over the entire kingdom. Now what's fascinating, we've been talking about the archaeology and, uh, uh, over the last couple of weeks on Wednesday nights, and there is archaeological evidence of this setting up of Darius' rulership under these 123 princes. Uh, there's actually documentation where you can see these 120 being set up and all of those kind of things. That For me, that's just fascinating. But these 122 leaders, not counting Daniel as the 123rd, but these 122 leaders must have been predominantly Babylonian given that they refer to Daniel when they're talking to the king after Daniel has continued to pray. They call him a part one of the children of the captivity of Judah. So the majority of these uh, leaders that are talking to Darius here must have been Babylonian. Now you can imagine from their perspective how much this had to eat at them. First of all, Daniel comes in as one of the captivity, and it's not very long at all before he has the respect of Nebuchadnezzar, and he's set up over a large portion of the kingdom and, and helping to, rule, to help uh, Nebuchadnezzar rule that kingdom, and there was a lot of respect between Nebuchadnezzar and, and Daniel. And now the empire has completely changed. None of the Babylonians are still rulers. Now you've got the Medo-Persians. And for these 122 Babylonians, it looks like history's repeating itself. 
Here we go again. A new empire, and all of a sudden, Daniel looks like he's going to be promoted to the point to where he's going to be ruling over all of the other Babylonians, even though he started out in the beginning, oh, so many years ago, probably in the neighborhood of over 60-some years, started out as a slave, one of the captives of Judah. And so... Uh, what ends up happening is, is a, as we read here, is a plan was hatched to try and rid themselves of Daniel and to get away from his influence. And, and they understood and they knew that the only way, they said themselves, the only way we've got anything against Daniel isn't because of anything he's going to do wrong. Now, get me, don't get me wrong when I say that. Daniel was not perfect. Nobody has been perfect but the Lord Jesus Christ. But what these Persian leaders, or what these Babylonian leaders were saying at this time is, is that there was nothing about Daniel that was that either even had any hint of corruption. And they also knew that because of his character, because of his integrity, because of all the other things that we've already looked at as we've looked at the life of Daniel, that there was absolutely nothing they could do to corrupt him and put him in a place where Darius would not trust him and they would set him aside as one of the rulers. They said the only way we're going to get rid of Daniel is if we can trap him because of his faithfulness to his God. That was the key. That's the only thing that they could do. I told you back in Daniel chapter number 3 when we looked at Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah that if you truly have a commitment to God and you truly have a commitment to His Word and His promises and you're trying to live according to the things that God has laid out, at some point, somebody is going to try to use that commitment against you. It happened with Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. We see it happening here with Daniel. And the truth of the matter is, if even in our day today, if we have that kind of commitment to God, at some point we can expect opposition as well. When we live a life of commitment to God, we'll find ourselves at, so, at some point being attacked because of that commitment. A life of commitment to Christ can lead at some point to, uh, uh, to us having to stand in a position or in a place or in a situation where what we're going to have to do is stand in courage because of the attacks. It can happen on the job. It can happen in the public arena. I know people who have stood for the things of God even in their own home. And because of that stand, it's cost them relationships with their families and all of those kind of things as well. So commitment to God at some point the devil will use that as a way of attacking you and getting you to back down from that commitment. And that's why for us to stand in a hostile culture, we have to be people of courage. It's a necessary part of having a godly witness in a hostile culture. So that's what we're looking at here is courage and a godly witness. Now, to get us started here, the first thing we have to understand is that, uh, that this was not, as we continue on in the story, and we'll get more into it next week, but we've, we're up to the point to where Daniel is about to be thrown into a den of lions. Now, I'm very careful about that wording, and so is Scripture. Daniel was not being thrown into a lion's den. Did you get that? He was not being thrown into a lion's den. He was being thrown into a den of lions. A lion's den is somewhere a lion sleeps. <laughs> a den of lions is not the same thing. Again, Wiersbe summarizes this so well. The, 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 den, the, the den of lions was a large pit divided by a movable wall that could be pulled up to allow the lions to go from one side to the other. The keeper would put food in the empty side and lift up the wall so the lions would cross over and eat, and then he would quickly lower the wall and clean the safe side of the pit. The animals weren't fed often, or they weren't fed great amounts of food so that their appetites would be keen in case there was to be an execution. Living at the gnawing edge of hunger, 
did not make them too tame. <laughs> That's pretty much an understatement. So this was not just a lion's den. This was just not a place where lions slept. This was actually an enclosure that was devised to be used as an execution point. And so this den of lions uh, was the equivalent in this area, especially in this, in this particular province. This was uh, the way that you executed capital punishment. All right? Now, secondly, not only was this not just a sleeping place for a bunch of lions, but secondly, we have to realize that at this point in the life of Daniel, he's somewhere in his mid-80s. Okay? Somewhere in his mid-80s. He wasn't a young man, and he didn't have a lot of reserves. He didn't have a lot of stamina. He was elderly, and he would have been tired of all the court drama after a long lifetime of dealing with kings and all of their prideful ways. And yet, he was a man of, of courage despite his age and despite the circumstances that he's facing. And as we look at this passage tonight and next week, we'll see the underlying foundation of what allowed Daniel to exhibit such courage both in the face of the den of lions and the fact of his age and all the things that are going on. So notice with me, first of all, that a life of courage is fortified or is strengthened by faith. Look at verse number 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house. <laughs> That seems so normal. <laughs> I mean, you know, here you've just gotten word. 122 princes have worked together to get this decree signed. They've got it signed. Daniel knows that he's the one on the chopping block about this. This is all about him and trying to get rid of him in this particular circumstance. And the Bible says that when Daniel finds out about the decree, he goes into his house. That seems so normal. It seems so just, you know, what? I mean, if you were close friends and if you had the ear of the governor of Babylon, this man by the name of Darius, and he had your confidence and you had his confidence, and uh, don't you think that the first thing that's going through your mind is, I need to go talk to him. I need to try to get this thing straightened out. Now, one of the unusual features about the Medo-Persian Empire and you see it referred to a couple of times here, you see it in the book of Esther as well, is that if a decree was signed by a king or a delegate, as uh, Darius is here in Babylon, if a decree or a law is written and put into place, once that law is put into place, it cannot be changed. So the, laws, the decree's been signed. Whoever prays or asks a petition of any man or God for 30 days besides Darius is going to be cast into a den of lions. Daniel understands it. He understands the implications of it. But that doesn't mean he was without options. If you go back to the book of Esther, you see the same thing. In the book of Esther, Mordecai, uh, uh, no, not Mordecai, Haman, there we go. Haman tricks Ahasuerus into signing a decree that basically is a death sentence for every Jew in the Medo-Persian Empire. It's signed. The date was set, uh, the, the day that the execution was going to take place, and if you've ever read the book of Esther or seen anything about it, you know kind of what happens. Long story short, Esther finally gets before the king after a tremendous amount of stuff, and she gets before the king and she says, you've been tricked. Haman did this because he's wanting to destroy the very people who I'm a part of, and that means I have to die as well. And, of course, we know Haman gets hanged on his own gallows. But then Ahasuerus does this really cool thing. He can't say, I'm revoking the day that they're supposed to be killed. So what he does is he signs another decree. And he says, on the day that this happens, every Jew in the empire has the right to defend themselves. And I don't care what you got to do to do it. And we know the story, if you study the book of Esther, you know the story there. The Jews defended themselves, they, oh, and they destroyed everybody that was trying to kill them. So Daniel wasn't without options. Now, if I'm Daniel, in my own human flesh, 
If I'm Daniel, this is kind of what my thought process would have been. I'm going to go to Darius, and I'm going to say, you know, King, I know they tricked you, and you signed the decree, and you can't do a thing in the world about it as far as changing that decree. But let me give you an idea. Fifteen minutes before sunset, sign a decree that says all the lions in the line then have to be killed. So they go in 15 minutes before sunset. They kill all the lions. Daniel gets thrown into the lions den. Has to stay there overnight. But nothing happens to him. Now, to me, that's slick. That's how you get out of that situation. So it wasn't that Daniel wasn't without options. Daniel was an incredibly smart man. He could have said, you know, I mean, the decree could have been anything. Throw me in the lion's den, but on this day, you can't open the gate. Daniel would have still been all right. I mean, any number of things could have happened here. Daniel was not without options. So it's important that we understand why Daniel just went into his house. Because he could have done a lot of stuff that would have prevented him from getting hurt or dying. But he chose not to. And I truly believe that the reason Daniel had the courage to just go home and do nothing was because he had such strong faith in his God. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think that the Bible is teaching here that in order to be a person of faith, you're never to stand up for yourself when the law allows. I don't think that's what the Bible's teaching at all. As a matter of fact, you go over to the New Testament and you see just the opposite thing happen. All right? Because you go to Acts chapter number 25 and you see Paul standing before Agrippa and Festus and he's there and it says in verse, starting in verse number 10, then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them, I appeal unto Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar shalt thou go. Now, again, now we're dealing with Roman law. And anybody who was a Roman, sin, or a Roman citizen, if they were accused of a capital crime, they had the right to go to the, our version of the Supreme Court. And that was to appeal directly to Caesar himself. So here's Paul. He knows that if they find him guilty, they can kill him. And he says, I've not done a thing that's worthy of death. He said, you guys even know it. He said, but I'm a Roman citizen, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to appeal to Caesar. He used the law of his day to get him what he was, what he was anticipating anyway would be at least a fair hearing. So the Bible isn't teaching us that for us to be people of faith that we just have to lay down on the ground and become somebody's walking mat. That's not what the Bible is saying here in the life of Daniel. But here's the difference between Daniel and the situation with Daniel and the situation with Paul. Paul's already heard from God that one day he's going to stand before Caesar. He's going to Rome. He knows. So what Paul did was use the circumstances of the situation that he was in to bring God glory by getting him to Rome just like God said was going to happen. Daniel, on the other hand, he's not heard from God. And in Daniel's determination, the best way to give God glory was to let this thing play out. So that's the question for us that we have to ask. When it comes to the point to where we're being persecuted or we're being tried for our faith, or we're struggling, you know, we're facing opposition. The question we have to ask ourselves is first and foremost, 
Will God get the glory if I take advantage of the laws of the land that I have access to? Or will God get the most glory if I let this thing play out? In Paul's situation, it was take advantage of the laws. In Daniel's situation, it was let this thing play out. And for each of us, if we're faced with that kind of a situation, we can be in the same boat. And we're going to have to ask ourselves the question, not how do I get out of this mess? That's not the question. Daniel could have asked the question, how do I get out of this mess? Oh, I know. I'll have him sign a decree to kill all the lions. And that would have got him out of the mess. But what Daniel's concern was and what Paul's concern was is in this situation, what actions of mine will bring God the greatest glory? Do I take advantage of the situation and the laws of the land that I have or do I let things play out and let God move in a way that nobody else can question or argue? That's an important thing for us. It really is. We've got to get to that kind of point in our life when we're facing persecution or we're facing a situation to where we're not concerned so much about how do I get out of this as much as what I want to know is, is how in this situation can God get the most glory? In Hebrews chapter number 11, that great chapter of faith, the Bible says in Hebrews eleven six 6 that without faith it's impossible to please God. And it's in that same chapter that we read of both people who took advantage of situations and escaped, and we see people who, took, who couldn't take advantage or didn't take advantage of situations, and they paid the ultimate price. But both of them, whether they, were, whether they escaped or whether they were executed or whatever happened, both of them were living by faith. The Bible says, and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon of, and of Barak and of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises. Here it is. Stopped the mouths of lions. Quenched the violence of fire. Where do you figure he's talking about there? Go back three chapters in the book of Daniel. Escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. What Hebrews 11 says is that sometimes the victory means you're okay. And sometimes the victory means that you pay the price. But either way, it's a victory. And either way, you're choosing to live by faith. So the first thing that we see here is that a life of courage is fortified by faith. But then also in verse number 10, we see that a life of courage is fortified by obedience. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, key thing there, his windows being open toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a four times. Now, that notice that it says here that Daniel opened his windows toward Jerusalem. And in doing that, he was being obedient to the word of the Lord that was given on the day that Solomon dedicated the temple all the way back in 2 Chronicles. In 2 Chronicles chapter number 6, verses 36 through 39, Solomon's praying. He says, If they sin against thee, for there is no man which sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them over before their enemies, and they carry them away captives unto a land far off or near, which is exactly what's happened to the children of Israel. Yet if they bethink themselves in the land where they are carried captive, and turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned, we have done amiss, and have dealt wickedly. If they return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, whether they have carried them captives, and pray toward their land. 
which thou gavest unto their fathers, and toward the city which thou hast chosen, and toward the house which I have built for thy name, then hear thou from the heavens, even from thy dwelling place, their prayer and their supplications, and maintain their cause, and forgive thy people which have sinned against thee. Solomon says, if we, if, if we sin and we're carried away captive, may the people there repent and pray toward Jerusalem. And that's exactly what we see Daniel doing here in chapter number 6. He opens his windows toward Jerusalem, and he plays in that direction. And of course we know that God's answer is given in 2 Chronicles 7.14 that everybody knows. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Not only was Daniel a man of prayer, and that's something we're going to look at here in just a moment, but we can see from the fact that he prayed facing Jerusalem and the temple that not only was his courage fortified by his faith, but it was also fortified by his obedience. And obedience would have been an integral part of what gave him the strength that he needed. Again, we see the same thing happen in the life of Paul in that same situation with Agrippa and Festus. When he stood before them, he told them, he said, I have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. And that heavenly vision was for him to preach the gospel. And that was why he could stand before them and be willing even to stand before Caesar. And years later, when the time would come for him to be martyred for his faith, he penned those familiar words in 2 Timothy chapter number 4, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul could say courageously, even as he was facing the last days of his life, he could say, I am now ready. Because he had fought a good fight. He had finished his course. He had kept the faith. In other words, just like he told Agrippa even years before, he continued to be obedient to the heavenly vision of preaching the gospel. He was obedient to the will of God. He was obedient to the word of God. To the very end of his life and to the very end of his ministry. And because of that, he, would, he had courage that he could stand even at the last moment as the axe was about to fall. Just like Daniel could say, well, I don't know where, I'm, I know where I'll be tonight after he was brought before the king. But then we also see that a life of courage, as I said a moment ago, is fortified or is strengthened by prayer. And again, we see it in verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows toward, uh, being opened uh, in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed. Now, again, Daniel's being obedient to Scripture here. Because we see this in Psalm 55, starting in verse 16. As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many with me. Notice that David says here uh, how his prayers were what strengthened him and gave him courage. Evening and morning and at noon, three times a day he prayed. Psalm 4 is, is another wonderful example again of what spurred David and probably just as likely spurred Daniel as well. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness, thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity and seek after leasing? Selah. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There be many that say, Who will show us any good? Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. 
Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only make me dwell in safety. David says here, he, he said, when I pray, God strengthens me and gives me courage for what I'm going through. When the apostles in the early church were facing the persecution of the Jewish leaders there in Jerusalem, again, we see them praying. In Acts chapter number 4, starting in verse 23, it says, And being let go, this being uh, 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 Peter and John, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they had heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. And notice this. And grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. They prayed for courage. They prayed for strength. They prayed for boldness. And when the time came, God answered their prayer. When discussing the armor in Ephesians chapter number 6, and we'll be talking about that here pretty soon in our Sunday morning series, we see that prayer is just as essential as all the other pieces of armor that we read there. Stand therefore, having your loins go about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Without a doubt, Old Testament, New Testament, the writings of Paul, the life of the early church, the life of Daniel... We see exactly the same thing. And that thing that we see is, is that prayer is what fortifies, one of the things that fortifies a life of courage. And if we're going to have a godly witness in a hostile culture, my goodness, we need courage. Now, there's still several more thoughts that we need to see in this passage on what strengthens our courage. And we'll pick that up next week. But let's stop right here and ask ourselves a few questions. Do you think that your faith is strong enough in God and strong enough in His Word to help you have the boldness and the courage that you're going to need in a time when things get hot. We've seen in the life of Daniel and in the life of Paul and in the life of the early church tonight how necessary these truths are if we're to be people of courage in a hostile culture. This is, an, this is not an academic exercise. This is real life. It's not a nice-to-have quality. It's a necessity if we're to be faithful to our God and Savior. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, is does my life 
exhibit faith? Does my life exhibit obedience? Does my life exhibit a prayer life that when the times get hot and the persecution rages and the trials come, will they give me the courage that I need to stand? Father, share tonight what you would have me to share and how I thank you for the encouragement that not only we see in the life of Daniel, but Father, we see throughout Scripture and even in the New Testament as we look at the life of the early church, we look at the life of Paul. And Father, may we leave here tonight with a strong conviction that if we're going to be people of courage in a hostile culture, that we have to be people of faith. We have to be people of obedience have to be people of prayer. We're going to look at some other things next week, but Father, this is the starting point. Are we going to live our Christian life in faith and obedience? And are we going to be strong enough prayer warriors that even when we're told you have to stop, we're willing to open up the windows and pray like we always have done before time? Strengthen us. Make us people of that kind of courage. And we'll give you the praise for what you do through us and in us and for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All hearts and minds clear. All hearts and minds clear.